totally frozen, so I'm going to have to log out and back in. Okay. We, we got your audio, but we don't have your, uh, your, yeah. audio, your video. Right. And now the yeah, pictures, I, pictures I see are frozen, too. All right. So cl clear your cache and come back in. We'll, uh, we'll see you in a minute or two. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get started in a minute. Hey, by the way, Mark, did you guys straighten out the thing about uh, the uh, membership dues, including the uh, the site key and all that stuff? Um, you know, I didn't even put that in my notes for today. Yeah, no, it's, it's really just it's yeah, it's just a matter of letting somebody know that you're you're paying your site key at the same time or or because we can separate that in the uh, as far as how the treasurer breaks it up you just gotta let somebody know that that's what you're doing well in my case if i've got any students that are interested in joining i've offered them the student membership for a year so i right. might be adding on to stuff there just in case okay All right yeah just just stay in touch with bill on that um so you can get that squared away so he knows what you're doing all right Hi, Carol. Bye, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I started recording. There she is. Hi, Carol. I started recording, so I'll start the meeting. Well, welcome, everyone. It's uh, 32 of us or so. Welcome to the astronomy section, November virtual monthly meeting. My name is Mark. I'm your president. Glad to have you guys here. Glad to see so many uh, so many people here this afternoon, this evening. Uh, we got an action-packed uh, agenda today. So we haven't had uh, multiple talks in a while, and we do have multiple talks tonight. And we have an election to hold as well. So I'll try to keep things moving smoothly here. So first, I must again thank Dave Pesh and his company, Expudo, for donating this service. This has been a, a godsend for us. We haven't had to have any limit in number of people or how long we use this. Uh, it's a little different from Zoom or some of the other ones that you might have been using over the course of your day. And I'm sure everybody's using these uh, conferencing tools and this they're all a little bit different. But uh, the fact that we can use this one on an unlimited basis has been a really a blessing for us. So uh, thanks to Dave Pesh. Um, if you've been here before, you know that uh, if you if it gets noisy behind you, don't be offended if I mute you. If you want to talk, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you could do that at any point in time. You could just go to your name and click the little uh, microphone next to you uh, or down at the bottom of the screen, right at the bottom of the presentation. There's a microphone. You can you can mute yourself or unmute yourself. So feel free to do that. Uh, if, if you're noisy, I'm just going to mute you. Don't don't be offended. Uh, you can feel free to use the chat. The chat's uh, to the next to the right of all the, the list of people and to the left of the presentation. You can uh, type anything in there. If you're not uh, on a microphone, you can chat to everybody. Uh, that way, and as Michael Richardson says, all the cool cats use the chat, so feel free. If you have a headset, uh, it's the best way to talk to anybody is we're using a headset because you don't get feedback from your computer and your microphone and all that stuff. So uh, that's the, the if you're gonna do a lot of talking, that's why I wear my headset when I'm when I'm hosting. It just it takes away all the background stuff. So on we go so here's our agenda welcome everyone i have some announcements i didn't put in this list that we're having an election this is what happens when you do these things and you don't think about them as you do them uh i have an election and then we have a short talk by dr michael richmond he wanted to address something that was in the newsletter and then our feature talk by larry McHenry, who is a, a, a amateur astronomy presenter that uh, I and several of you have seen many times over at the Black Forest Star Party. He has a whole slew of subjects that he talks about. And uh, Dave Bishop got a hold of Larry, and uh, Larry's going to do a talk on the Herschels and their catalog. And there he is. There he, I don't know which side he is for you guys, but there's Larry. Uh, and we we'll look forward to hearing uh, Larry do his talk on the Herschels and their catalog. So welcome, Larry. Happy to be here. So I just thought I want to turn my uh, video off here for the rest of the All meeting. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll cue you to come back on when you're ready. All righty. All right. All right. So first of the announcements, I, I want to ask if anybody's done any observing recently you want to talk about. I put some pictures up there from some people that have done some observing lately, but anybody else want to talk about their observing of late? Yeah. 
Yeah. I spent a few hours at the uh, observatory today and was, for the first time, was able to image that uh, sunspot group AR2781 in uh, white light, hydrogen alpha, and uh, calcium K. Uh, it still looks like the atmosphere is full of smoke. It was a high haze all day today and kind of breezy, but uh, I just couldn't help but spend spend some time down there. Uh, the weather was right. And the we'll temperature be temperature uh, was right. Yeah, we'll be maybe looking at the same uh, sunspot group tomorrow at open house. Fantastic. Look forward to that. I went out. Uh, I was trying to get a. Uh, a uh, expand on my planetary uh, trip through the uh, through a virtual star party, and I actually got some images of Neptune. And uh, you can see a picture, uh, my picture of Neptune that I've got. That's a video of uh, a couple of minutes, and then I enhanced a little bit through Registax of uh, of Neptune. And then Kevin had a fantastic image. He did a Halloween night, getting all kinds of atmospheric effects, the polar ice cap, and lots of great detail on Mars and Mars is still really, really uh, bright. Uh, it's still fairly close. It's not as close as it was in, the, in mid October, but it, it is moving away, but still a lot bigger than it's been, uh, than it will be for a while. And Sam just bought an eyepiece kit. So I bet you're excited. You know what you did, Sam, when you buy something new, is you, you curse the skies and then it gets cloudy when you buy new, uh, <laughs> astronomical equipment so <laughs> uh, so Gary wants to know what Kevin used um, I don't know if Kevin's on Is Kevin on Kevin what did you use to do that Mars picture you did on uh, on Halloween he might be he might actually be uh, observing right now imaging right now if i know kevin he's actually got his he did this last meeting too he was outside doing uh, imaging at the same time he was listening to the meeting uh but i he uses two different telescopes uh he has a 10 inch uh mead that he uses uh and he'll do he'll, he'll do some uh he'll use barlow i don't think he does projection with that but he'll use a, a barlow with that so he'll have a, an f20 setup uh doing that imaging and he uses a a, a a ZWO ASI, I think it's a 290 to do that imaging. There he is. Kevin, what did you use to take that Mars picture that I'm, I'm showing right now? I'm not hearing him. Anybody else do uh, do some imaging? Or do, do some, do some uh, observing. Planets are really cool to see right now because there's, there's so many and they're so available right now. All right, we'll move on. All right, so uh, we've done four virtual star parties so far. They're all in the can. They're all recorded. If you want to visit them, there are actually links in the newsletter. There might be one that's missing. The last one might be missing. And I, I could send that out along with the link to, to this meeting when we're done. After we're done with this, I'll send the link to this meeting in the last star party. Uh, but I want to do one more, at least one more star party with the planets since they're all pretty visible. I want to see if we can't get some better imaging of the ice giants, both uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune and Mars is still great to see. It might be a little late to get anything else with Saturn and Jupiter. They're getting closer and closer to the horizon earlier and earlier. So they could be difficult to do imaging of, but keep an eye on them. Jupiter is going to continue to move towards the east, towards Saturn. And when we get to December 21st, they will be less Help me out with this, Steve. I think it's less than a minute apart. I think they're going to be. I think they're going to be six minutes apart from each other and look like one dot in the sky. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, it's it's, it's really close. It's under a degree, and it's significant. It's like a tenth of a degree that they'll be apart and they'll almost look like one dot in the sky. So that could be 
an imaging opportunity for anybody who's done some planetary imaging this summer to, take, to try to do some imaging of. That's going to be a pretty cool thing to see. Now, Steve says it's the closest in 1623, but that was hidden in the sun's glare. So the previous time was only in the 1200s. That's a long, long time ago. Pretty cool to see. But uh, that's what I hope to do with the next star party is do some more planetary stuff. So Alcor and Mizar are 12 minutes apart. So they're going to be closer. I think it's I think it's half of that, Jeff. That's a great uh, that's a great measurement. Anyway, let's move along. All right, so this is our slate for an election. And what I'm going to do is Mark, I'm going to, yes. Mark, before you move on, you need to give me status so that I can uh, create the yes. poll. Yes, Since I'm going to do that right now. Had to log in again. So I'm going to come back down here to Pete, Peter. So I'm going to make Peter the moderator and presenter. And Pete is going to Peter's going to take over the control to moderate our elections. All right. So I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Why don't you give the instructions? Okay. One second. Okay. There I am. Uh, I am going to start a poll. Everyone can see the uh, candidates for the board that are on your screen. I'm going to start a poll. You will be voting yes or no for the entire slate. And I will keep a record of that. I'll see not how you specifically vote, but I'll see the total number. Um, and then I will let people know how we do. So I'm going to start the poll now. It's just a poll that says yes or no. It's changing rapidly. While you're voting, uh, Bill Schlein points out that the uh, that the uh, conjunction of Saturn and uh, Jupiter is going to be really low in the sky. So yeah, it will be. It'll be right after sunset, so we've got to watch for that real low in the sky. So taking pictures might be hard. <laughs> you got to take them before it actually sunsets. Sunsets. All right, I'm going to wait about another 10 seconds if anyone else hasn't voted yet. And I have the results. All right, we'll, 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 we'll get the results in a minute. You're going to screenshot those for me, Peter, for us? Yeah, I've done that. OK, all right, well, I'm going to take over the presenter, and we'll go through the results afterwards. Yep. OK, all right. So coming up uh, tomorrow, we've actually rescheduled this. So note the rescheduled date. Tomorrow, we have an open house, uh, 12 to 4. Uh, at the Ferris Center in Ionia. If you need the address, it's actually 8355 County Route 14. Uh, you can go to our website and find that if you, uh, you didn't have that uh, handy. Uh, we have the same COVID protocols as member observing, and I'll go through those up once tonight instead of going through it each time we go through it. But that'll go through it to the, to the member observing coming up in another slide. But tomorrow from 12 to 4, uh, if it's sunny out, which we expect it to be, Bob will have the solar building open. We'll do some solar observing. If you want to tour the place, be glad to open up buildings and show you uh, the scopes, how we use them. If you uh, if you want to learn how to use those buildings on your own, we're glad to show you how to use those buildings. Uh, you can come out and visit. And you know, once you're a member, you can come out and use those buildings at your leisure. So look forward to uh, the seeing some people out there for the. Uh, the open house tomorrow and we moved this up because it's going to be so nice we know that it's going to be perfect what i mean the mid 70s i think our low 70s tomorrow so uh come uh, a week from now it's, i think it was projected to mid 40s so uh i was kind of poked by carol to do this and so great idea carol i want to give you credit for that thank you so much for the idea we got to get together every chance we can before the snow flies 
<laughs> Very good. Thank you so Great. much. Great idea, Carol. All right. Uh, we're going to have our board of directors meeting. That's again be virtual. We're going to use the same uh, platform, but we have a, a, a link with a password to join that meeting. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a short talk on something that came from the news. Um, so the directors meeting will be on Wednesday from seven to nine. If you want to come, let me know. I'll, I'll email you a link and you can join us. Any members welcome to join our uh, directors meeting on Wednesday. Uh, but that starts at seven o'clock uh, this coming week. All right, and then we're going to have a, a members observing night. This would have also been our open house, but uh, this is the new moon weekend. And so if it if it will stay fairly warm, we'll actually do some observing. And I'll go through the uh, protocols that we use for any time we gather at the Ferris Center yes. for the member observing uh, next, next Saturday, the open house that's uh, this Saturday, tomorrow. I want We need everyone to sign in on arrival and in the main building, Excuse me. Right inside the door, in the uh, in the main conference room, will on the right hand side of the table will be a uh, clipboard. We ask everyone to sign in so we know who's there. In the event that we have to trace contacts with an active case of coronavirus, uh, it's very important that. And if we meet as a group, uh, even if we try to keep our distances, we are obligated to make sure that we know who's there when we gather. So please, please sign in when you uh, when you come in at the uh, at the desk uh there's wipes there to wipe and hand sanitizer to uh to wipe the pen wipe your hands whatever ensure you're six feet away from people and anytime you're not six feet six feet away make sure that you're wearing acceptable face coverings uh the building capacity is normally 60 people so uh we're allowed to be at 50 percent of that or under so 30 people which i don't think we're going to get 30 people at any one point in time but you never know uh, inside the building, no more than 30 people and four people at a time inside the uh, the cave roll off or the Wolk roll off buildings. Um, tomorrow, both of the bathrooms will be cleaned the day of the event and they'll be available for use with, the, with these rules. We ask that you wipe the faucet and handles with the disinfecting wipes and they're there on the sink or on the table next to the sink. Uh, before and after you use them, if you use the, the seat, wipe the seat. Uh, don't flush any of those wipes. Please put them in the garbage after you use them or on a, or on a septic system, so we don't need to put that stuff in our septic tank. Um, and then wash your hands. If you're going to be there at night uh, during the member observing, use red lights, please, only after dark. And those are, that's actually not a COVID rule, but that's just a general rule for member observing. Uh, we do have some extra red lights in the library behind the behind the door when you walk in, right behind that door are extra lights. If you borrow one, just put it back. So uh, any questions on those rules for uh, member observing? All right, and those are for good for any time we meet at the Ferris Center. So tomorrow, these will be the same rules in effect. Please sign in if you come in tomorrow, just so we know you're there in the event that something happens. We've had a great safety record. So it keeps us, uh, we keep we keep ourselves occupied and uh, we can actually do stuff and actually see each other by, uh, by observing the rules. So thanks to everybody that's uh, that's complied so far. It's been, uh, we've had some pretty nice events so far this year. All right, coming in December, alas, we will not have our holiday party at the, at the uh, Strassenburg. Uh, it's just not possible. The Strassenburg can only accommodate 35 people at a time inside the uh, the Star Theater, uh, and I think we're we're actually scheduling shows far enough apart where we can evacuate the building before the next group of people come in for the next show. So the shows are all spread out as well. So anything further you want to say about the Strassenburg, Steve, while you're here? Uh, we are fortunate not to have been classified as a movie theater, so the audiences have been great about keeping masks on during the whole time during shows. But we, as you mentioned, we're putting a 45-minute gap between performances to ventilate and rearrange chairs and swab things. And uh, so we're doing what we're doing what we can. And hopefully, the region holds. Up. Hopefully, hopefully. Great. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, we're doing online programs too. Short plug there. Right, go ahead. Want to say something about those? 
Oh, we've been, we, we're, we're doing astronomy courses. We just finished a, uh, an astronomy course on how to operate Stellarium for 10, 11 to 14 year olds. And we're going to start another section of that. And we're looking, we're working on other ideas as well to uh, expand the programming into the online realm, which gets us beyond Rochester. Excellent. So if you're if you're a member of the RMSC, you probably get some of this information by email. But if you're interested and you're not a member, you can go to the RMSC site and you can see a lot of this stuff is uh, is there to, to follow up on if you're interested in uh, in more of that stuff. Thanks, or, Steve. Or just email me directly if you want to be kept on a list for future developments. I got a bunch of those lists. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so December, we will have a meeting. We will meet right here on uh, December. I didn't put a date there. It's Friday, December 4th. Uh, so it'll be a regular meeting time instead of a, a holiday meeting time. Our speaker is going to be Kelly Douglas, who's a visiting professor at U of R. Several of you are taking one of her courses virtually uh, this semester. She'll be doing another one next, another couple next semester. Uh, I, I don't have a talk yet, title yet from from, uh, from Kelly on her uh, talk, but she does involve her studies involve large scale. Uh, influence on galaxy evolution, environmental influence on galaxy evolution. So, well, we'll see what she wants to talk about, and I'll have that information for us for you before the meeting uh, next month. All right, one more event uh, in December, but I want to bring it up now. So, that if you want to plan for it, now December is typically a cold month, but something unusual is happening. The Geminid meteor shower is is on happens on Sunday, December 13th. And what's interesting about the Gemini, if you read uh, Sky and Telescope, I read this article and maybe many of you have as well, but uh, the Geminids are surpassing the Perseids as uh, the quote unquote favored meteor shower, if, if, at least by uh, zenithal hourly rate. And the the zenithal hourly rate of this Gemini meteor shower is 120, which means at its peak, we, we should see 120 meteors per hour under perfect conditions, which is pretty amazing. That's like two a minute. That's a lot of, that's a lot of meteors to see. So we'll look forward to, um, to perhaps seeing that. Now, the other thing about this shower is it its peak is – uh, pretty wide. It's about eight hours before and eight hours after. You still get some pretty good meteors, uh, and its peak would be at about 8 p.m. on Sunday, the uh, the 13th. So earlier in the day or even later in the day, uh, we could see meteors from the shower. The great thing about this is that the new moon is at 11 o'clock the next day on the 14th. So the skies will be dark. Uh, if we have clear skies and decent weather, it could be a really good meteor shower to come out for if you want to come out to the uh, Ferris Center. So we'll do a member observing event on that Sunday, the uh, the 13th, to observe the uh, Geminid meteor shower. All right. So, Peter, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, so what did you get from the elections? We had 35 people voted, and the slate passed by a vote of 34 to 1. Awesome. And I do have a, a I have a screenshot of that that I will get to the board for the next board meeting. Very good. Very good. Appreciate your moderating the, uh, the election for us, Peter. Thank you so much. Sure. I appreciate being people being on the board. Actually, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's my that's next, a lot of that's work. That's my next slide. Is and, and I'm thanking. You see the people that are there that are running. I want. I, you, we need to thank these people, but there's there's many many more people to thank besides these people that are elected and voting. There are probably at, I don't know, maybe ten times as many people in the background that uh, mow the lawns, uh, attend events host events, plan events, uh, do all kinds of stuff for the, the, the astronomy section that I couldn't list them all here. And, I, and perhaps that's something I will do in December is have some kind of a thanks for uh, scrolling thanks for those people. It's, a, it's an amazing list of people 
that uh, that do that make this thing go around. These just happen to be the people that vote on the on what we do as far as spending and uh, making uh, decisions for the group. But uh, I want to thank everybody who works hard to make the astronomy section as strong as it is. So thank you guys so much. All right, with that, to I'd Mark, like to turn over to yes. Before yes. you go, uh, would you <clears throat> recognize we have a new member here? We do. Uh, yes, uh, Sam Valerio. Yes. I, uh, I recognized Sam at the beginning. I don't think you're on yet, but uh, I asked if it was his first meeting, and it is his first meeting. Yes. I know generally well, welcome, you have to do the agenda. I just yeah. wanted to let him know we are, you know, we welcome him. I've already sent him uh, a welcome note and everything. So glad to see him awesome. here. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Yep. So, uh, if you weren't on earlier, and, I, and I'm remiss in not, not asking if there's anybody, this is their first meeting. That's usually the first thing we ask. So I think I asked it before I actually started uh, the meeting part. So thanks, Sam. Thanks for okay, coming. Okay, I was late yeah, joining. I was, having, I was having some dessert. So. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Sam actually helped build, helped to dig the uh, the trench for the mineral shed. Uh, was it last week, week before? Oh, that's very good. Then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. With that, uh, Michael, I will uh, I will switch the screen to your. Uh, presentation and then I will turn it over to you to do the talking. I'm going to minimize my video. Is that flashing? It looks flashing to me indeed. Yeah. Oh, now it's the Yeah. So uh, hello everyone. I hope that we'll have the uh, present, the, the presentation set up. If you're interested in uh, uh, looking at this later on, uh, you can grab a copy of it on the internets from a uh, location I've just typed into the chat. So if you want to put that into your browser or bookmark it for later, uh, that's a place you can go to find this information later on. So. Um, the latest issue of the Azras newsletter included an item that uh, appeared originally in 1993 when apparently, that was before my time, but apparently there was a contest to solve a problem. And the problem was, as you can see in the middle of that quotation, if the Earth could suddenly be stopped in its orbit and allowed to fall unobstructed towards the sun under the influence of gravity, how long would it take? And um, from this little uh, bit that I can see, apparently uh, two people submitted an answer 80 days, and two other people, Tom Day and Chuck Spolhoff, said about two months and were originally declared the winners of a Milky, bar, Milky Way bar. But uh, sometime later, there was a, uh, a correction, and it was said that the, the actual answer was about 27 days. So. That, that didn't quite seem right to me, 27 days. And so I thought I'd look into this question. So what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to try to show you the one way to solve this problem. Now, there are lots and lots of ways of doing it. And this way I'm going to show you is not the only way. But I think it's a, it's a pretty good way to understand what's going on. So um, if at any time you have questions, please unmute yourself and, and shout them out, or you can type them into the chat, and I'll ask Mark to watch the chat and let me know, because I can't see the chat while I'm trying to talk here. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, a relationship between two uh, quantities in the orbit of a planet around the sun. One of those is the period, how long it takes to go around, and the other one is the size of the orbit. And this relationship was originally discovered by a guy named Kepler. You can see here uh, one of my favorite XKCD comic strips describing Mr. Kepler. So what Kepler realized back in the uh, late 1500s, early 1600s, 
after he'd been studying the orbits of planets in the solar system for quite a long time, he realized that there was a relationship, a mathematical relationship, a beautiful mathematical relationship between the period P and the semi-major axis A of each planet's orbit. Now, if you want to write that relationship in its modern form, that's the first equation that's shown there. It has a four pi squared on the top. It has the total mass of the sun and the planet added together on the bottom. That's not quite what, what Kepler wrote. Kepler wrote a, a sort of simpler version, and that's the one we're gonna be using tonight. So the simpler version just says P squared equals A cubed. So P is the period in years, and A is the semi-major axis measured in astronomical units. So let's, let me review what those things are. So if you could scroll down to this first uh, graph, please. All right, so here's a schematic of the uh, orbit of the Earth around the sun. So the sun is that yellow thing with an S on it, and the Earth is the blue thing with an E on it. So the Earth's orbit is, is nearly a circle, so I'm, I've just drawn a circle for it here. And um, the distance between the sun and the Earth is one astronomical unit. That's the definition of the astronomical unit. So that's AU for short. So it's one AU from the Earth to the Sun. And, and how long does it take for the uh, Earth to go around the Sun? It takes a year. So if you wouldn't mind scrolling back up to that equation, please, Mark. If we look at that equation there, P squared equals A cubed, if A is one for one AU, and P is one for one year, then you can see that one squared equals one cubed, and the equation works because one equals one. So hooray, Kepler was right. So um, if you scroll down to the next figure, please, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to build on this. So if you want to, um, you can define the semi-major axis of an orbit in a slightly different way. It ends up being the same thing for the Earth. So if you take a planetary orbit and you draw the longest possible straight line from one side of the orbit to the other side of the orbit that goes right through the sun, that is called the major axis of the orbit. And then if you cut that major axis in half, that's the semi-major axis. So when you have a circle like this, it doesn't matter what diameter you draw. All lines that pass through the sun from one side of the orbit to the other, they're all the same length. And as you can see in this diagram, if you go from the very left-hand side to the very right-hand side of the Earth's orbit, you'll go 2 AU. So the major axis has a, a length of 2 AU, and that means the semi-major axis, which is half of that, is just 1 AU. So this is all kind of a silly way to do it if you're talking about a circular orbit. However, if you scroll down, please, you will see that not all orbits are circles. So here is another orbit I've drawn, this orbit shown in the sort of reddish color. This orbit is an ellipse, which has the sun at one focus. So imagine a spacecraft that was launched from Earth, and it shoots out, and it fires its rockets, and it goes out through space, and eventually it settles into this reddish orbit. Now this orbit is not the same as the Earth's orbit, this orbit is squished a little bit. And the sun is not at the center of this red orbit. The sun is at one focus of this elliptical orbit. However, if you look at the orbit, the longest length across the orbit from left to right, running through the sun, that longest diameter is still two astronomical units long. So that means the semi-major axis of this elliptical orbit is exactly one AU. And what that means, if you just scroll down a bit to the equation, please, what that means is that whether you're looking at the Earth going around in its circular orbit, or whether you're looking at the spaceship that's going around in that reddish elliptical orbit, the period squared is going to be one cubed for the Earth, and it's also gonna be one cubed for the spaceship because those semi-major axis are both one. So that means that that spaceship traveling in its elliptical orbit has exactly the same period as the Earth, one year. Okay, 
So let me take things to a slightly more elongated extent. So here's another orbit that has a semi-major axis of 1 AU. And this is even more squished as an ellipse, but it will also have a period of one year. So no matter how you squish the ellipse, if its semi-major axis is 1 AU, it has a period of one year. Are there any questions with what I've been saying so far? Nope. All right, so don't worry. We are going to get to this question of how long would it take the Earth to fall into the sun. We're, we're about halfway there. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to change the size of these orbits. So I'm going to pick my spacecraft, and I'm going to put it into a new orbit that is smaller than the Earth's orbit. So this one is definitely smaller. This is a circular orbit whose diameter is one astronomical unit, and that means its radius is only half of an AU. So this spaceship traveling in that little orbit is clearly going to take less time to go around the sun than the Earth does. Question is, how much less time does it take? So can you scroll down? I, I have an equation that, that might help you. Um, so let me ask people, is the period of this orbit going to be longer or shorter than one year? I guess I already gave that away, didn't I? Yeah, I did. So let's go on. <laughs> let's go down. How much shorter than one year will it be? Well, if I use this equation, there, could you stop there? Great. Yeah, that's great. So if I note that the semi-major axis, the A value for this new smaller orbit is just a half of an AU. That means into Kepler's law, I put a half on the right-hand side. And um, if any of you at home have calculators or maybe computers sitting in front of you, you could solve this equation and you could tell me how long is the orbit of this little circular spacecraft. So is anyone out there brave enough to get out his calculator or computer and tell me what's the period of this spacecraft's orbit? You can just type it into the chat if you don't want to shout it out. Mark, is anyone typing a number into uh, the chat? I, 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 I see people, I see people, people typing. typing. People you see typing. people typing. OK, people are, are working on this. It's, it's a cube. So, 0.35 of a year. Or the Who said that? Of uh, so someone said about 0.35. I wonder if someone else, can we get a confirmation of that? Maybe a second person can say yes or no. I got 0.35 as well. OK, Patrick's well. Patrick's got 0.35. Okay. Bill Rogers had 0 0.353. Ooh, 0 0.353. He must be carrying it. He, he must have a very quick pencil. So if you scroll, down, someone... uh, yeah. if you scroll down no, just a bit here, you'll see. No, I have a 50-year-old uh, calculator. <laughs> yep. So uh, in this case, if we had a spacecraft that was orbiting in that little circular orbit, it would have a period of about 0 0.353 years. And that means about 129 days. So that makes sense. Closer to the sun at all times, smaller orbit, travel faster, take less time. OK. Now, if you scroll down a bit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, that nice circular orbit, and I am going to squish it. So scroll down again. Here we have another orbit who is, whose semi-major axis is, again, one half of an AU, but now it's, it's squished down into an ellipse. The sun is at one focus. That looks like quite a different orbit. The, the planet's now going to go very fast when it's close to the sun. It's going to go slower when it's far away from the sun. But the time it takes to go around that orbit is, again, going to be 129 days because the semi-major axis is one half of an AU. And if you make it even skinnier, scroll down, please. So there's a really skinny elliptical orbit. That also takes 129 days to go all the way around once. And if you could somehow build a spacecraft that was able to take the enormous temperatures that you'd get, if you went right around the outside of the sun and came back, if you squished that elliptical orbit to almost a straight line, well, it would still take 129 days to go all the way around. 
So now, what does this have to do with the time it takes for the Earth to fall into the sun? Well, I am going to call upon a word that strikes fear into the hearts of instructors everywhere. And that word is symmetry. Can you scroll down, Mark? Symmetry. I am going to say that something is obvious by symmetry. Now, when students do this to us instructors, we have to figure out, are they actually seeing the deep underlying fundamentals of the physical problem, or are they just trying to answer the problem that they don't know how to answer? It's obvious, by symmetry. Well, this is what I mean in this case. So if you have a circular orbit, like the Earth's orbit around the sun, if you cut it in half, and you make the top half red and the bottom half green, how long does it take the Earth to travel along the, the top half? Well, it takes a year. Oh, sorry, not a year. It takes half of a year, of course. It takes half of a year because it takes the same amount of time to go along the top half as along the bottom half. They're the same size. They're the same shape. It's going to be the same time. So we can say that if you have a circular orbit and you cut it in half, the top half will take half of the uh, period and the bottom half will take another half. So could you scroll down, please? Now, if you look at an elliptical orbit, not a circular one, you can still cut it in half as long as you cut it in half the correct way. And the correct way to cut it is along this major axis so that you're cutting through the longest section of the orbit. And if you do so, the time it takes to go along the top half, shown in green, will be one half of the period. And that's equal to the time taken to travel along the bottom half. That's going to be also half of the period. So let's go down to our extremely, extremely narrow elliptical orbit. You can't really see the two halves because they're lying on top of each other. But if the total time it takes to make one orbit is 129 days, that's to go from the Earth to the Sun and back to the Earth again. Well, if you only want to go halfway around the orbit, from the Earth to the Sun, then it should take half of that time. And that means, scroll down please, that means the time it should take for something to fall from the Earth's location to the Sun is what? What is half of that orbital period, gentlemen and ladies and everyone? 64 and a half days. 64 and a half days, exactly right. And, if, and so if, if you go back to the very, very uh, beginning, I think you can see that, that the people who were originally judged to have answered the problem correctly, Chuck and, um, who was it, Chuck and Tom, did they not say it was about two months? And I, I, I think that's about 60, 60 days, 64 days. Yeah, so right. I would claim that, that they, they were correct. They earned their Milky Way bars. So if you, um, if you don't believe me, if, you, if you're suspicious here, if you scroll down, once again, if you would, to the very, very bottom, there's another way, there are many other ways to solve this problem. One of the other ways to solve this problem is to run a numerical simulation where you have a computer calculate the, the forces on the object that's dropped from the Earth's location, and you calculate its acceleration and its change in velocity, blah, 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 blah. There are a number of different software packages that you can use to do these calculations if you don't want to do them by hand. And I have links to several of them. And if you wanted to, you could try saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take an object, put it at the Earth's distance from the sun. Here's the mass of the Earth. Here's the mass of the sun. I'm going to let it go. And I'll let the computer calculate how long it takes to fall. And, and I predict that if you do that, you'll end up with about 64 and a half days. So if you don't believe me, you can do it yourself. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. Very good. Questions for Dr. Richmond? Bill Schlein's typing. I, I would doubt, so seriously doubt that uh, anything Chuck Spielhoff said was an error. The guy was pretty good at what he did. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't set the record straight while, while he was around to appreciate it. But he did get deep the Milky Way bar, I'm sure, before they, uh, they ah, thank it goodness. back. 
<laughs> is there a terminal velocity in space beyond the speed of light? Uh, I'll leave that for another day. But that's an interesting question. I just can't answer it in the little time we have now. It's a, it's a deep question. It's another it question. Is. Yep. And we can't go back in time, Bob. Sorry. All right. All right. So that's all for me. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Richmond. Thanks, Michael. All right. So we stop that. And uh, we will move on to uh, Larry McHenry. So, Larry, let me give you the. Uh, the reins here. So Larry, you have control and you actually what I you should I mean I'm gonna take it back for a second, Larry. I'll put you I'll put oh, it on the screen. So all you gotta okay. do is, is scroll right. through it. Hold on a moment. I gotta get my yeah. mask. <clears throat> Your mask? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just wanted to comment there that um, rather than Milky Way bars, maybe this year you should hand out Mars bars. I, you know, I thought of that, and since it was Mars bars already, I said we just or Milky Way bars already. I said we just leave them Milky Ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry, the floor is yours. All righty, I'm going to hide my video. So uh, let's see here. Maybe I'll hide my video. Just click the camera down below the presentation there. Ah, there we are. All right. There we go. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see and hear me. Um, so good evening. My name is Larry McHenry. I'm an amateur astronomer with the Kiski Astronomers and Oil Region Astronomical Society in Western Pennsylvania. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the lives of William and Carolyn Herschel, two of the greatest astronomers from the Age of Enlightenment, which marked the birth of modern science. We'll also cover their greatest contribution, their catalog of deep sky objects, and we'll discuss a few of my personal observations of these objects. So, let me find the right button. There we go. Uh, so here's just a high-level outline of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about William's life, Carolyn, uh, when they're together in England, uh, the survey work they did, how dangerous it was. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about personal catalog, uh, again, some of my examples and their lifetime achievements, and we'll wrap up the presentation. So let's get started. Frederick Wilhelm Herschel was born on November 15, 1738 in Hanover, Prussia, which is now part of modern-day Germany. He was the third child out of ten of his parents, Isaac and Anna Herschel. Isaac was a member of the Royal Hanoveran Foot, Car Foot Guard Regimental Band, Sounds like something out of Beatles' Yellow Submarine, but it really was, that's what it was called. Uh, but early on, Isaac taught William and his brothers music, and, um, and also uh, he paid to have his sons receive extra instructions from the garrison teacher in mathematics and French. And additionally, Isaac was a keen reader, and he loved to discuss philosophy at home with William and his older brothers. But most importantly for both William and Carolyn, Isaac had a personal interest in astronomy and taught all his children the constellations and the names of the stars at night. So as a teenager, William joined his father as a member of the Hanoveran Guard Band. Uh, but William ended up fighting with the Hanoveran Regiment during the Seven Years' War in a uh, disastrous battle with the French at Hastenbeck. With his regiment defeated and musket balls flying around him, William took refuge behind a hedge and eventually made it back to Hanover. Well, with fear of the French invasion, and as William was just a mu musician, he really wasn't enlisted or even trained as a full-time soldier, his father, Isaac, decided that it was best for William to get out of town, leave Prussia, and he helped him escape to England in 1757. There, William found employment as a music teacher and organist in Bath, England. In addition to the oboe, uh, William played the violin and harpsichord and later the organ at the local chapel. He quickly became a very successful musician. He composed numerous musical works and gave many concerts. He eventually was able, through his concerts, to fund paying for his younger brother Alexander and his sister Carolyn to come join him in England. Herschel also was appointed the director of the Bath Orchestra, and his sister Carolyn, who he trained, would often appear as a soprano soloist. So a little bit of information about William's life. 
Now let's talk a little bit about Carolyn. So Carolyn Herschel was born in Hanover on March 16th, 1760. She was number six out of 10 children. Her mother, Anna Herschel, generally disapproved of education for girls, but she did allow Carolyn to learn basic reading and writing skills and along with some home skills such as knitting and cooking that would make her more eligible for memory, uh, marriage. It wasn't a very progressive time uh, in that period. Um, but her father, Isaac, o, did teach Carolyn how to play the violin. And William and his older brothers would sneak music lessons to Carolyn as often as they could. At the age of 10, o, Carolyn was struck with typhus, which stunted her growth, and she never grew taller than four feet, three inches. So she was incredibly short. But as a young girl, Carolyn always looked up to her older brother, William, and greatly missed him when he moved to England. So she was quite excited when William came home to Hanover on a trip in 1772 and decided to bring Carolyn back to England to live with him. On the long trip back to England, William began teaching her to speak English. And at night, when their coach was traveling through the countryside, he would point out the consolations to Carolyn. Well, once settling in at her new home in Bath, Carolyn began taking uh, singing lessons every day from William. This was in addition to also learning bookkeeping and being put in charge of running the household for her two brothers. Soon, though, Carolyn became the principal singer at Williams' concerts and acquired such a reputation of her own as a vocalist that she was offered varying, various paying engagements, such as the annual Birmingham Festival. Together in England. Well, during this time, after Carolyn had joined him in England, Herschel's music career led him to an interest in mathematics and lenses. This, in turn, led to an interest in astronomy, and like his father, William became an avid amateur astronomer. First, reading uh, any astronomical, astronomy book or list of tables that he could borrow or purchase, and then buying a quadrant so he could measure the locations of the stars himself, to even renting a small reflector, and then finally proceeding to build his own seven-inch reflecting telescope with help from Carolyn and his brother, Alexander. I guess you could say William had aperture fever. Um, William would spend up to 16 hours a day grinding and polishing the speculum metal primary mirror, which was the standard of the day. They didn't have glass mirrors at that time. They used a mixture of, uh, of metal. Um, according to legend, William wouldn't even take time out to sit down for dinner. So Carolyn was forced to cut up his food and feed it to him while he worked on the mirror. Carolyn and her brother Alexander were also themselves greatly involved with the construction, working on the telescope tube and the eyepieces. Now, all this took up every free minute of time that they had because there was still music lessons and concerts and church performances that they gave to keep the house over their heads and to pay for the workshop and the equipment and the supplies needed to build this telescope. But finally, in late 1773, the telescope was finished and William Herschel began to observe the stars and the planets. Now, soon Herschel though, developed a reputation as a somewhat obsessed observer, going as far as when in the middle of a music lesson, William spied clearing skies out the window, and he, um, he dropped his violin, and he ran out to observe with his telescope, dragging the music student along with him. Word of his observing skills with his telescope began to spread far and wide, leading to other local astronomers stopping in to introduce themselves and to have a look through his telescope. Through this, William's interest in astronomy grew even stronger, especially after he made the acquaintance of the English astronomer royal, royal Nevin Maskelyne, through a mutual friend who had become impressed with Herschel's knowledge of the sky and his skill as a telescope maker, and then reported such back to Maskelyne. So, with the Royal Astronomer's encouragement, William began sending regular letters and observing reports to him. And then he in turn would pass these on to others at the Royal Society, praising Herschel's observing and telescope construction skills. Well, Herschel's early observational work focused on the search for pairs of stars that were very close together visually. In October 1779, with encouragement from the Astronomer Royal, Herschel began a systematic survey search for stars among every star in the heaven, and he soon discovered many more binary and multiple stars than was expected, and he compiled them with careful measurements into their relative positions 
into two catalogs presented to the Royal Society in London. The first one in 1882, which included 269 double star systems, and the second one in 1784, consisting of 434 systems. But before, uh, on March 13th in 1781, at the age of 42, William Herschel observed this object with an unusual disc-like shape. At first he thought it was a new comet, but after following it for several nights and calculating its orbit, he realized that instead it was a new planet beyond the orbit of Saturn. William quickly sent a report to the astronomer Royal who encouraged Herschel to write an account of his discovery and the technical details of his telescope and his observing method, all that kind of stuff. And this was presented to the Royal Society on April 26 that year, which then led to an invitation to William to travel down to London for a formal reception. Well, once the new discovery had been confirmed over the summer by various observations from professional astronomers across Europe, Herschel was invited back in November to London, where he received a gold medal from the Royal Society, and he was inducted as a member. Now, William wanted to name his new planet after King George III of England, um, thinking that would get him some favor you know, with the, with the king. But the general consensus of the worldwide astronomical community was to follow the classical Greek and Roman gods and naming of the planets, so the name Uranus was chosen for his new planet. But for his discovery, King George in 1782 did knight William Herschel as the king's personal astronomer, and William was given an annual pension. This allowed Herschel to retire from music and devote himself full-time to astronomy. So who says astronomy never pays? Like William, Carolyn had always been interested in the night sky from her father, teaching them about the constellations when she was a young girl. So she was a willing participant in William's new endeavor. After William began his astronomy surveys, Carolyn learned how to record, reduce, and organize her brother's astronomical observations. At William's insistence in 1782, Carolyn even began to make her own solo observations. In 1783, William gave Carolyn a telescope that he constructed especially for her, and she began to make astronomy discoveries in her own right, particularly comets. She eventually discovered eight comets, 11 nebula, and updated and corrected John Flamstein's Catalog of Star Positions. This was published as the British Catalog of Stars, and she was honored for this work by the recently formed Royal Astronomical Society. Carolyn also continued to serve as William's assistant at the telescope. In 1887, she became the first woman to receive a salary for services to science when she was granted <laughs> by King George III for her work as William's assistant. Together in England, the survey work begins. So that summer of 1782, after William received his pension, uh, the Herschels quickly relocated to a small village within a mile of Windsor Castle and commenced building a new and This telescope was named the 20-foot reflector. For the next 20 years, from the late 1782 to 1802, William and Carolyn Herschel conducted systematic surveys in search of deep sky or non-stellar objects with his telescopes. Herschel used two telescopes for his survey. Again, the 20-foot reflector, which actually had a 18 half inch speckling metal mirror. And later, after they relocated to a better location near Slough, the great 40-foot reflector, which had a 48-inch mirror. Now, both mirrors were made by the Herschels and had to be regularly polished as the metal mirrors were quick to tarnish in the wet climate that England is noted for. So when it, when he constructed the 40-foot mirror, Herschel, Herschel actually made two sets of the mirrors, one of which he kept polished and stored indoors, ready to be swapped out with the working mirror whenever it began to go bad, when it began to tarnish. And then during the day, he would work on getting the swap mirror repolished while he continued his and Carolyn's nightly observations with the good mirror. Now, most of Herschel's recorded observations, though, ended up being made with the 20-foot telescope, as the larger 40 foot turned out to be a little cumbersome to use and also suffered from um, tube current distortions. 
it was no modern day truss tube. So it had, you know, two currents throughout the night. The 20 foot was eventually was the instrument that William's son, John took with him years later to Cape Town, South Africa to use in surveying the, the Southern sky. Now Herschel's telescopes didn't have clock drives to track the stars. So instead he would point the telescope to the meridian and let the earth's rotation carry objects across his field of view while he was up on a ladder observing. William would then call down the Carolyn at the bottom of the telescope whenever he saw anything interesting that passed through the field of view. And then she would write this down, his descriptions and the time and, and where the telescope is pointing. And then Carolyn would quickly read this back to William and he would confirm the observation while the object was still in the eyepiece of the telescope. This method of back and forth allowed them to observe and record a nightly east-west strip of the sky. Then the next day, the two of them would use their recorded observations to calculate the object's positions and, and indicate it on a star chart. They would then move the telescope's elevation up or down a little bit in preparation for the next night's survey run. Using this method, they were eventually able to observe all the sky visible from England. They ultimately discovered well over 2,400 objects defined by his unique classification system, which we'll talk about in a minute. And during this 20-year survey period, William Herschel also wrote numerous papers on varying astronomical subjects, which he regularly presented to the Royal Society. He also supplemented his annual pension income by producing over 300 telescope mirrors that he sold around the world. Dangerous work. So even with a pension as the king's personal astronomer, didn't necessarily mean that the Herschels led a leisure-free life. They still needed to build, maintain, and physically use the telescopes at night. This sometimes led to some dangerous accidents. In the summer of 1783, William, who was always trying to make bigger mirrors, attempted to cast a 36-inch speculum mirror using a new metal alloy formula that he hoped would be strong enough not to sag from his own weight. So William with his brother Alexander had completed the mirror mold. They fired up their furnace oven and they melted over 500 pounds of metal for casting the mirror. Well, as they poured the molten metal into the mold, it began leaking from a crack. And before they could really do anything, the metal just gushed out, poured out, hit the stone floor, causing the floor to crack and literally explode, for flinging rock fragments over their heads as they ran for the door. And you can see here in the picture, it shows uh, where they passed the, uh, the flagstones that literally exploded from the metal being dumped on it. Another time, late at night, uh, William went to sharpen one of his tools and, and falling asleep at the wheel, he nearly took off his fingers on the grindstone, almost ground down his own fingers. And then Carolyn, who is, of course, William's constant companion in his nightly observations, recording everything at night that William observed through the telescope and fetching anything that William needed. Um, you know, during one night's observation run on the 20-foot telescope, Carolyn, coming back from an errand, adjusting the telescope alignment, tripped on the telescope's framework and became impaled on an iron hook used for securing the ropes that controlled where the telescope pointed. She was pinned to the sharp hook, which had gone deep into her leg and had to call out for help. Well, after several minutes wondering where the heck his sister had gotten to, William finally heard Carolyn calling for help, and he went down to try to help her, but he couldn't get her off the hook either. So he had to run back to the house to fetch several servants, and all of them had to pull her off that sharp hook. Now, Carolyn didn't come off the hook very easily, and she later wrote that when she was helped off, quote, they could not lift me without leaving nearly two ounces of my flesh behind, end quote. Ouch. <laughs> so anyway, she was laid up for several weeks recovering from that injury. And then finally, another time, William and Alexander narrowly avoided being crushed by the one-ton 40-foot mirror when swapping it out to be repolished. They had lifted it up with a tackle and beam system, uh, and while they were supporting it, the beam cracked and nearly dropped the mirror on top of them while they were like underneath of it trying to support it. So definitely dangerous work. Now, the Herschel catalog, 2,400 plus objects and the Herschel class, classification system as a scientific revolution. Now, William Herschel published his deep sky discoveries as 
three separate catalogs over the years. First one was called a catalog of 1,000 new nebula and star clusters published in 1786. The next was called a catalog of a second thousand new nebula and clusters of stars published in 1789. And the third one published in 1802, can you guess the name? Well, you're wrong. It's, he shortened it. He just called it a catalog of 500 new nebula. So Herschel's classification system, though, he divide, divided it into eight categories. And oh, this slide kind of came out a little funky here, but um, you kind of get the idea. Uh, class one is bright nebula. Class two is faint nebula. Class three, very faint nebula. Uh, class four, planetary nebula, which is a, a phrase he invented. Uh, class five, very large nebula. Class six, very compressed and rich clusters of stars. Class seven, compressed clusters of small and large stars. And finally, class eight, coarsely scattered clusters of stars. Now, one of Herschel's main goals uh, during his survey work was to observe the sky systematically and map the distribution of stars to gain a picture of where the sun stood in relation to the Milky Way. In all, Herschel cataloged over 9,000 stars, far more than any of his predecessors, and he increased the number of known nebula and clusters from Messier's 103 objects at the time to close to 2,500 objects. Herschel was the first to invent and use a method of classifying deep sky objects. This was a powerful tool in understanding the relationships between the different objects in the heavens and changed the focus of astronomy. Herschel was especially interested in the classes of nebula that he discovered. Herschel theorized that the differences in various nebulas' appearance was due to their age, their distance, and the effects of gravity. He felt that these objects were evolving in time and that the universe was in a constant state of change. Herschel's theory resulted in a scientific revolution that the latter-day Victorian and modern-day astronomers used to create our present-day understanding of our galaxy and the universe. So in a way, you could say that cosmology started with William Herschel. Now, each of Herschel's subcategories are numbered in sequential order by when they were discovered within that category. So unlike the Messier objects, which are in order of discovery, uh, for example, Herschel objects, say in class seven, number 255, may have been discovered years before object 81 in class three. In Herschel's time, the galaxies were considered to be all just nebula. Uh, so there's really no separate class for galaxies and they are mixed among the first five classes. Nearly three quarters of Herschel's objects, though, are classified as type two and type three, faint and very faint. And these are mostly galaxies. Now, Herschel's classes are actually kind of still useful in giving an observer the idea of what the object will look like visually through the telescope. For example, class one objects are bright nebulous objects, though some are actually galaxies. And class six objects are indeed generally very nice, bright, rich, open star clusters. So again, they are somewhat useful even today. So let's look at some of my examples from the, uh, the various Herschel classes. Oh, but before we do that, though, let's talk a little bit about the ingredients to successfully observing the Herschel objects. As I have on the slide here, uh, if you're using visual methods, um, you're probably going to need um, maybe a moderate sized telescope, maybe a 10 inch or 17 inch or greater. Um, though there are a lot of Herschels that you can observe in smaller telescopes, you know, eight inches or maybe a, you know, a four inch refractor even. Um, you're gonna wanna try to observe the Herschels, especially the very faint ones from a dark sky location. And I know some here like to go to Cherry Springs. That's an excellent place to go, um, you know, for dark skies. But even if you can't make it to Cherry Springs, just you know, find a, um, you know, or the local observatory there that, that you have, uh, just find a dark corner of your backyard and just make sure that there's no light shining on you or, you know, while you're trying to observe and maybe, um, you know, put like a, a hood or something over your head while you observe. Um, you know, you can, that will help increase your, your, your acuity and you can see more of the fainter Herschel objects. Electronically aided, um, you can use various things to, 
to help you, you can do what I did for most of my observations. I used a deep sky uh, video analog camera, uh, a Stellacam brand. Um, you could use, you know, if you have a CCD camera already or DSLR, those are great. Uh, and of course, uh, any kind of telescope really for imaging, uh, anywhere from, uh, you know, two inch refractor all, or all the way up, it really doesn't matter. Um, of course, it helps to have a, uh, a mount that will track and the go-to mounts are also useful. Um, regardless of which methodology you use, visually or electronically aided though, you'll want to have some star charts that you can use as reference. Perhaps you'll want to use some planetarium software, some of the other planning tools out there. And of course, you should have an observing plan. And um, preferably, you want to get a list of the Herschel catalog, maybe sort it by constellations to help you find these Herschel objects. Okay, so here we go. Let's step through the different categories and look at an example, a few examples of each one. So class one, bright nebula. This Herschel class tends to be objects of various sizes and shapes, such as galaxies, clusters, and nebula. But the one thing they all have in common is that they are very bright objects. These are the easiest Herschel objects to observe. And a prime example of a class one bright nebula is um, NGC 5195, known as also as M51, the Whirlpool Nebula. Now, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, didn't uh, Messier discover this? Well, yes, he did. Um, now, Herschel generally tried to avoid relisting Messier's uh, objects. Uh, Messier and Herschel were contemporaries, and, and actually um, Herschel was friends with Messier, so as a courtesy, he tried not to list them. So in this particular example, of what Herschel was referring to is not the main galaxy here that Messier saw. He's really referring to the companion galaxy. So he's kind of got away with it that way. So, um, but anyways, it is a bright nebula. It's located again in Keynes Venaci or you know, right off the handle of the Big Dipper. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, a video capture image, uh, 90 seconds with a six inch RC, bringing out lots of good details of the spiral arms. And here's a sketch I made with an eight inch reflector. Again, showing that you can use smaller telescopes for the brighter Herschel objects. Class two, faint nebula. So this Herschel class tends to be objects that are generally faint, such as unresolved clusters and dim galaxies. You'll need fairly dark skies and again, maybe a medium size or, or bigger telescope to hunt these guys. An example of a class two faint nebula is a globular cluster in Hydra, uh, NGC 5694. This actually has a Herschel number. It's Herschel number 196 in class two. Um, don't really worry about the Herschel numbers. Nobody really uses those these days. Everybody goes with the NGC numbers. But again, you can see it's in, again, Hydra, very close to the border of Libra. So it's kind of a spring object. And as you see here from the video capture image, it's pretty faint. And you know, even with the sketch here with the eight inch reflector, it's just barely hovering on the edge of resolvability. So again, a faint nebulous object. Class three, very faint nebula. Here we go. So the Herschel class tends to be made up of very, very faint objects. And again, these are vast majority are galaxies. Uh, this class of objects definitely requires a dark sky location, uh, definitely a large telescope and um, you know, whether you're doing visual or CCD imaging, you might even need a bit of luck because these guys can be hard to find. Uh, an example of this is, of course, the galaxy in GC 488 in the constellation of Pisces. This is well placed for observing this time of year. And you can see here with the video capture image, 25 second, it's just a little fuzzy thing. Uh, the core is kind of bright, has a little bit of starlight core to it, which makes it a little bit easier to find. But again, most of the objects in the class three, very faint. Class four, planetary nebula. Well, this Herschel class tends to be made of objects that are actually planetary nebula, but you can find some other emission nebula and galaxies mixed in. This was sort of Herschel's catch-all category, his, his junk drawer, so to speak. This is where it, when he saw an object and he wasn't quite sure what it was, he threw it in here. He said, oh, we'll call it a planetary nebula and I'll go back on a later observation and maybe figure it out better. So he threw things in here. That's why some things in here are not really planetary nebula. So some examples of planetary nebula, class four, 
uh, in GC 2392, the Eskimo Nebula in the constellation of Gemini, the twins. Um, here's a um, video capture image, 45 seconds with an eight inch Cassegrain. And then here's a sketch made of a 13 inch reflector. Uh, one of the nice things about this planetary nebula is it's bright enough and big enough that you can actually see the shells around it. So again, a very pretty winter type um, planetary nebula. Another one in this category is NGC 2438 in the constellation of, of Pupus. Uh, and this one's kind of fun. It's actually located within the open cluster M46. Uh, here's a video capture image, 20 seconds. And here's a sketch made of an eight inch reflector. So again, this is a fun planetary nebula because it's sort of a two for one. You get to see a, a nice splashy bright open cluster with this tiny little planetary nebula embedded in it. Class five, very large nebula. What is Herschel class tends to consist of very large deep sky objects. They may not necessarily be very bright though. Depending on the object, you might need a dark sky location and maybe a wide field, rich field type telescope. So an example of class five is in GC 253, the silver coin galaxy in the constellation of Sculptor. Again, well, well placed for the, this time of year for observing. Here's a video capture image with a six inch RC, 25 seconds. And here's a sketch of a 13 inch reflector. Again, this is large and bright. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised that Messier didn't discover this himself. Uh, but again, an example of a, a, a large, bright nebula. Another large nebula, NGC 2024 in Orion, the Flame Nebula, as it's known, it's located right next to the Belt Stars uh, Alnatic. Um, this is an example of a large nebula that is actually kind of faint. This is rather hard to see visually because it's located so close to that bright star. And you can see in the image here, I positioned the star just off the out of the field of view, but I'm still getting diffraction spikes from the star. So that's that can be hard to find. Class six, very compressed and rich clusters of stars. So this Herschel class tends to be mostly resolvable uh, globular clusters and some large open clusters with numerous members. An example from this class would be uh, NGC 869 and 884 in Perseus that we know of as the double cluster. Again, sort of a bright and splashy, uh, rich compressed cluster. Here's an example video capture with a 50 millimeter refractor for eight seconds. And then here's a sketch made of an 80 millimeter refractor. Class seven, uh, compressed clusters of stars and large stars clusters of small and large stars. So this Herschel class tends to be open clusters containing bright foreground stars or cluster members with widely varying luminosities. These are generally the best open clusters that you like to observe. An example of one is open cluster in GC 457 in Cassiopeia right here and it's known as the ET or OWL cluster. Here's a sketch made with a 13 inch reflector and then a video capture image with eight inch McCassie grain. Um, I always see it more as an owl than ET phoning home. Another one is um, open cluster NGC 2362 in Canis Major, located near uh, Taw Canis Majoris. Uh, we look at the bright star, very easy to find because it's, it surrounds this bright star. And uh, it has sort of a triangular shape to it. Again, it's you know, very pretty, splashy cluster, regardless of whether you're imaging it or, or looking at it visually. And finally, class eight, coarsely scattered clusters of stars. This Herschel class tends to be loose, somewhat dim open clusters. Uh, these are generally the poorest of open clusters and uh, most people skip over these because there's most of them are, are not really not worth much you know, maybe not even worth the effort to find, but unless you're doing the Herschel catalog. These are best suited for wide field eyepieces. An example of this class is NGC 225, also in Cassiopeia. And here's a video capture image with an 80 millimeter refractor. It's not too bad of a cluster, but again, you see it's very coarse, very loose, maybe just a few dozen stars. You know, again, you know, most people tend to overlook these open clusters. So, 
that just gives you an idea what to expect when you go through these various uh, different ca uh, categories that Herschel lumped all his observations in. Let's move on a little bit and talk about some of William and Carolyn's lifetime achievements. On November 30th, 1788, at the age of 50, William Herschel finally settled down to family life by marrying a, a local lady named Mary Pitt, who he had been courting for several years. William and Mary had one child named John Herschel, born at Observatory House on March 7th, 1792. Well, John didn't take up astronomy until well after 1816, having first pursued careers as a lawyer, then a mathematics professor at Cambridge. But like his father, son, John soon became obsessed, obsessed with all things astronomy, eventually learning how to polish the 20-foot speculum mirror from his father and building a new telescope framework to support the telescope. In 1821, with William at the age now of 82 and in declining health, he and his sister Carolyn made one last survey sweep of the skies in order to train John on the proper procedures of using the 20-foot telescope and recording the observations in the same format that they had been using over the last 40 years. John Herschel then went on to expand his father's deep sky catalog using the 20-foot telescope at Cape Town, South Africa, and became a great astronomer in his own right. Well, in addition to his discovery of the planet Uranus, William Herschel also discovered two of Uranus's moons, Titania and Oberon, along with two additional moons of Saturn, Mimas and Enceladus. Herschel was the first to measure the tilt of Mars, and he discovered that the Martian season impacted the size of the ice caps visible on Mars. Herschel also invented the word asteroid, meaning star-like, for the class of minor planets that were being discovered during his time. And again, he also came up with the term planetary nebula to describe nebula that looks like little planets. In fact, the, uh, the first planetary nebula that Herschel discovered, he actually thought it was another planet, and he actually tried to track it for several days, seeing if it moved or not. Herschel also observed the sun and tracked sunspots during the day. And while trying to build a better solar filter in 1800, discovered infrared radiation heating by sunlight. He did this by experimenting with passing light through a prism and using a thermometer to measure each color spectrum's temperature. Well, after taking the measurement of red, he pushed the thermometer outside of the red range um, and suddenly realized he was actually getting a higher reading than anything in the visual range. And that's how he discovered infrared heating. He also discovered over 800 confirmed double star systems and that they move around a common gravitational center. His theoretical and observational work became the foundation of modern binary double star astronomy. He was the first to devise the theory that our galaxy was disk shaped along with our solar system's direction of travel through space. And he believed that nebula that we know today as galaxies were clusters of unresolved stars that he called island nebula. Well, <clears throat> despite his numerous important scientific discoveries, though, Herschel did have a few wild ideas. In particular, he believed that every planet and moon in the solar system was inhabited. He also thought that sunspots were actually holes in the sun's luminous upper cloud atmosphere that allowed views to the sun's surface below, which he thought must also be inhabited. So he was out there a little bit in some respects. Finally, though, on August 25th, 1822, at the age of 83, William Herschel passed away at Observatory House, Windsor Road in Slough, and he's buried at nearby St. Lawrence's Church in Upton. Well, after William Herschel's death, his son John had the no longer used great 40-foot telescope dismantled as it had fallen into disrepair and it actually had become dangerous to try and use as a telescope. John actually held a small farewell party inside of the telescope tube as it laid on the ground. And then here is a, a picture of the telescope tube scaffolding. John was uh, an early adopter of photography, and he took a, an early photograph of the scaffolding before it was disassembled. Now, Carolyn, uh, in 1822, following her brother's death, she returned to Hanover, Prussia. 
she never married while living with her brother, and she really didn't get along very well with William's wife, Mary. And as the survey work had stopped, there was really nothing holding her in England. So she did stay in touch though, with her favorite nephew, John, and she constantly exchanged letters with him. Um, upon John's request in 1825, Carolyn revised William's original catalog to make it easier for John to navigate. The Royal Astronomical Society in 1828 presented her with a gold medal for this work. In 1834, when John took the 20-foot telescope to South Africa, he would send back his observing records to Carolyn, who was charting calculations, just as she once did for her brother and John's father, William. In 1835, she was elected to honorary membership of the Royal Astronomical Society as the first honorary female member. In 1846, at the age of 95, she was awarded the Gold Medal for Science by the King of Prussia. Finally, William, Carolyn Herschel passed away in Hanover on January 9th, 1848, at the age of 97, and she's buried there. Now, William Herschel's discoveries of nearly 2,500 deep sky objects were supplemented by those of Carolyn Herschel's 11 objects that she discovered and by his son, John Herschel's South African observations of another 1,754 objects and was published by John as the General Catalog of Nebula and Clusters in 1864. And it contained 4,264 objects that the Herschel's as a family had discovered. This catalog was later edited by John Dreyer, supplemented with new discoveries by many other 19th century astronomers, and published in 1888 as the New General Catalog, abbreviated NGC, of 7,840 objects. So this is where the NGC comes from. It's based off of the Herschel catalog, the work of the Herschel family. The Herschel's observing technique of surveying cataloging and classifying what they had found and then using that data to try and understand the structure of the universe has become one of the most important tools of modern astronomy. So if you ever travel to England and you're in Bath, uh, you can actually still visit uh, Herschel's original house. It's a still stands. It's a row house. Here's a picture I got from the internet of the front of the house. In the back of it is the garden and William used his initial telescope uh, to discover Uranus and make other observations. There's a statue back there uh, in the garden of William and Carolyn with William looking up and Carolyn writing down what William sees. And if you make it to Greenwich, um, there's a section of the 40 foot that's been preserved and it's on display there on the ground. So you can visit that and check it out. So let's wrap up this presentation. In conclusion, William Herschel was one of the most notable observers in the history of astronomy. He's often referred to as the father of observational astronomy. But in a way, both Carolyn and William are the mother and father of us amateur astronomy astronomers, as all their discoveries were made with telescopes and mirrors of their own making. And as most stargazers do today, all their observations were made outside in the open, exposed to the elements, and not from inside an observatory building. So hopefully this presentation has inspired you to learn more about William and Carolyn Herschel. Try your hand at exploring the Herschel catalog. Um, if you'd like to read more about the Herschels, there's a lot of great books out there. Uh, you just go to Amazon and, and search on the Herschels. A couple of my favorites are one called The Georgian Star, about the life of William Herschel and his discoveries. Uh, another great book is called The Comet Sweeper, about um, the perspective from Carolyn's point of view. And then finally, another great book called The Age of Wonder, which talks about several other Enlightenment era uh, scientists with a huge section about the Herschels. Of course, over the years, various astronomy magazines, Sky Telescope, Astronomy, Deep Sky, etc., had articles on the on the Herschels. Uh, and of course, Google and Wikipedia are your friends. Just you know, pull them up in Google, you'll find all kinds of information. If you'd like to see more of my observations of uh, the Herschel objects, you can go to my website, uh, which I have here. It's called stellar-journeys.org. And when you pull up the website, you just page down the left-hand title section uh, table of contents and you'll get to a link called the Herschel objects 
tour and you just click on that link and I'll pull up another page. And um, on the right hand side is some information about the Herschels and the left hand side is a table with uh, some basic information on each Herschel object and a, a link that will display either a photograph, a video capture image of mine or a sketch depending on what telescope I was using. Uh, initially, it displays the Herschel 400. If you click on this other link up here, you'll get the entire Herschel 2500 objects in your entire catalog. Um, generally, when I do these types of presentations at Cherry Springs, I have a handout that I give everybody uh, that has images of the examples I use in the presentation because those of you who've been at Cherry Springs knows that the projector during the daytime doesn't always do justice to what you're trying to, trying to show. So uh, there is a handout here. Um, again, this is actually on my website. Uh, you can find it, again, by going to stellar-journeys.org, paging down the contents to come to a section called PDF Downloads. That will pull up a page that has all my handouts from all my various past talks. And you'll find one here for the night's talks, uh, Herschel objects that you might see tonight. Um, also, if you're interested, uh, I do have a Herschel 2500 observing logbook that I, I created from some other logbooks. It's posted out there and you can download that and use that to track your own Herschel objects. And finally, one last note, um, on May 13th of this year, I completed observing the entire Herschel catalog, all 2,482 identifiable Herschel objects. Um, over the years, uh, even though Herschel initially thought he had 2,500 objects, there were a few that he kind of doubled up on and they've kind of figured that there's really only 2,482 specific individual objects. I spent a total of 239 nights uh, going back many years, but I didn't really get serious about doing the Herschel catalog till around 2012. Used all different types of telescopes during this project visually at various size Dobsonian telescopes, uh, some eight inch McCassick range, some refractors. Electronically, again, most of my uh, video capture images were done using uh, the various Stellicam line of video cameras, um, Stellicam uh, EX, which would give a two second exposure, Stellicam two, eight second, Stellicam three, which is unlimited. Uh, the past year though, I have transitioned over to ZWO cameras I'm currently using an ASI 294 collar camera. And again, I used various telescopes for the video capture from small refractors to my standard workhorse, which is an 8-inch Smith Cassegrain. Um, I made all my observations from uh, not only from my backyard here in Pittsburgh, uh, which I'm located less than eight miles from downtown Pittsburgh, uh, but also from various local parks and from dark sky parks such as Cherry Springs State Park or Calhoun County Park down in West Virginia. Uh, so it took a while, but it was a worthwhile observing project. I encourage everybody to try it themselves. So that does conclude this presentation uh, on William and Carolyn Herschel and their catalog. And at this point, I will let uh, Mark take control again, and uh, I'll, well, we can open the floor up to any questions that anybody might have? Wow, thanks, Larry. That was fantastic. Any questions for Larry? You're getting lots of congratulations on completing the uh, the Herschel 2482. That's that's pretty impressive. No, thank you. Know, you. Yeah, it, it, it was one of those things where you know it's like you know after a while I, I I did the Herschel 400 and it's like well I got you know the next level that you know I got most of those so. I just started adding to it. And then, you know, the hardest part was actually finding a catalog to download that I could, uh, basically all I did is I just take, I just took it, I sorted it by constellation to make it easier. Cause that's, that's how I do my observing. I, I see what constellation is hitting the meridian well-placed and that's where I do my observing for the night. But uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, it might seem like a lot, but you know, once you start it, eventually you'll, you'll get through it. Some of those class threes are really, really faint. <laughs> they are tough, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I would have needed a, 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 a you know large, you know, twenty-four inch or greater telescope for some of those. So, you know, amazingly, a video astronomy does bring most of those in the range, even from my light polluted backyard. Larry, I want to compliment you not just for your observations, but for your history 
on the Herschel, some of the stuff you pulled out there, is, I thought was great uh, that I would, I've never known. And I've taught astronomy for almost 20 years. Thank I you. thought it was really good. Thank you. Actually, if you go to that PDF download page that I displayed earlier, and you scroll down a little bit further once you pull that up, I actually have this presentation as a PDF that you can download. And I have much more information about the Herschels than what we have time to present tonight. So if you're ever up late at night, you need something to help put you to sleep, please pull that up. So. I just put uh, your website up there. So HTTP stellar-journeys.org, all kinds right. of great information there. Right. Jeff, Jeff Carr asks, how long did it typically take for the Herschels to build a telescope? Oh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it wasn't, it was something like he sort of did on the side, you know, you know, because, you know, you know, early on he was a musician and stuff, so he worked on it at night. Um, I did think it, it took a number of months to actually build it. Because um, back then, you know, you couldn't just go out and buy a, a mirror blank or stuff. You had to basically do everything from scratch yourself. And, of course, they didn't have, they didn't yet have the technology, the way to, the silver glass mirrors. So they made these things out of a, what's called speculum metal, which is an alloy, alloy of a, tins and um i forget the other one bronze maybe i forget uh brass maybe and uh so they would have to get, attain the supply of the metal you know they would have to heat it up you know make it and then they would have to grind it out well this metal once it hardened uh, was very brittle so you could easily break it while you were polishing it and i think he did that several times and didn't have to start over the good thing was you just take the metal and remelt it and make a new mirror out of it Interesting. But it was a, a family questions? project, though. Both Carolyn helped him and his, his younger brother, Alexander, they all assisted, you know, where they could. There's quite but, yeah, a family they, of group. Yeah, very interesting people. I mean, um, you know, one of the things I like to do in, in my observation projects, I, I, I kind of like, you know, I'm sort of a buff of history. I like reading about the astronomical history that we have, you know, and Herschel's or Charles Messier or, or, uh, you know, E. e. Uh, Bernard, you know, those, you know, it, to me, it adds more to the observation to know about these people while you're out observing these objects. Now I try to bring that into my presentations. Well, you certainly do that. You really bring the, the history of the Herschel's alive. It's, it's amazing how close that family was through all the, uh, all their observations and to bring mm -hmm. such an incredible catalog to us. Any other questions for Larry? So ha have I ever met anyone who else who has personally observed the Herschels? Um, not personally though, uh, you know, I, I belong to Cloudy Nights and there's there's you know a number of people there who have you know completed the Herschel catalog. Uh, some have done it, you know, completely visual. I cheated a little bit. I did again video astronomy, but you know, with astronomy, it doesn't really matter what technique you use. It's just, you know, it's the journey, so to speak. So, <laughs> yeah. Did I use Herschel on, on SEDS? Actually, that was one of the tools I used. Um, I used, um, um, let's see, I'm probably, I, there's a book by Mark Braxton called Observe the Herschel Objects. Um, you know, I used that as a guide, though he, came up with a, a less than the eight number that I settled on, the 2,842. Um, and I also used SEDS as an internet, uh, Wikipedia. Um, WikiSky is also another good resource that I also used. I mean, there's there's good resources out there, you know, both written and also on, on the internet. I know we have at least one other member who's, who's working on his Herschel 400. He's just, he's not on, uh, his microphone's not on, but I know Hank's real close. Hank Baronsky is very close to doing the Herschel 400. Oh, I see. It looks like he finished it. Finished? He did. Oh. When did you finish it, Hank? <clears throat> and Dave oh, Bishop did it as well. Wow. Great. Well, I keep saying I'm going to start it, and I think you've inspired me that I need to, I need to get outside and get my list together and get a plan and uh, mm -hmm. get back to start. I probably have observed so many of them already that I don't even realize I have. Yeah, that was the thing was, you know, back in you know, the early 2000s, I was actually using George Keppel's uh, Night Sky Observer's Guidebook as a guide. And I was going through each constellation 
observing the, the major objects and that. And I kind of wrapped that up. I'm like, well, what should I do next? So, you know, as a member of the astronomy club that I belong to, I'm a member of the Astronomical League. And anyone who's ever, you know, gone on their websites familiar with all the great observing programs they have. So I looked up, I downloaded the Herschel, and I started looking through it. And I'm like, oh, I got that one. I got that one. I got that one. Yeah. And I had like three quarters of them already without even realizing it, you know. That's so I finished the 400 and that just led on to the next thing. Yeah. There you go. Bill yeah. Rogers asked. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Bill Rogers is asking what was uh, John's work primarily in the Southern Hemisphere? Um, he um, was an astronomer at that point. Um, and he, he went down there. He took the 20 foot reflector, as they call it, 18 half inch mirror and set it up down there and, Basically, he was observing all the southern sky objects that you could you can't see from the skies of England, and he was there for quite some time. I, I want to think maybe almost two years, if I remember right. And then, he, of course, he would rec record the observations in the exact same format uh, that William and Carolyn used. I don't know. I could never find where who his assistant was who recorded the observations, but. He would then again ship those off to Carolyn, and then she would reduce the observations for him. Amazing. Oh, the last one, low galaxy and hydrant. I saw that from Hank. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, the one I had the most trouble with was an Ursa Major, and that's because my home observatory that I have. It's um, if you go to my, my website, there's some pictures of it. But it's it, basically it's a barn shed. And it's lined up um, on the meridian. And on the, the south side, I built the section where the roof flips up like a clamshell. So I can see everything you know, to the south and when it hits the meridian, but I can't see to the north of me, which made polar alignment very interesting to do. Um, so in order to do Ursa Major and some of the other polar constellations, I always had to wait for a trip, you know, to Cherry Springs or whatnot. And, you know, see, of course, you know, Cherry Springs, you, you go up there, and it always rains. It always rains, you know. <laughs> <laughs> at, at least some of the time. <laughs> at least some of the time. Yeah, that's right. That's a little secret about Golden Cherry Springs. When you go, plan on staying a week there. That way, you'll you'll know you'll get at least one or two good nights. But that's why I had to do it. it. It took me a few years to get all those northern objects. Any Ready. other comments? Questions? Carol says, imagine how difficult it was for the Herschels to do the work in England with skies as cloudy as ours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. What's, what I think is, is interesting, you know, well, with the Herschels and also when you think about Messier is, you know, they did it from nearby cities. You know, you know, Herschel was you know, sure. not that far from London, you know, and Messier, Charles Messier, he actually did all his work from the middle of the city of Paris. So, you know, you have to remember back in the, you know, early 1800s, you know, that time frame, there was no electric lights. It was maybe gas lights at night, but it, you could walk out your door and you'd see the Milky Way. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Oh, yeah, North American Nebula. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that one was definitely a, a video capture for me. <laughs> Tough one. All right. Well, Larry, thank you so much. Appreciate your, your coming to, to visit us this evening. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to sit on your meeting. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope to see you at Cherry Springs next year, if, if that's at all I, possible. I hope, be, <laughs> I hope to be at Cherry Springs next year uh, and get out of my backyard. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you there. Well, thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, Larry. All right. Thank hey, you. Any, feel free to turn on your cameras, anybody, if you want to. You want to. Uh, Talk for a minute or two or see what's going on. I'm trying to close this presentation here. There we go. Uh, it's stuck there. So Larry's done a number of talks for us. He's, he's still on it. And uh, maybe we can convince Larry to come back again. He, I don't know if you're still listening, but uh, you've got a whole whole uh, slew of talks that you do. do the Herschel one was one of the most interesting ones I've seen him do. He's done talks on Dark Nebula and uh, the um, 
uh, what's his name? E. E. What is his name? Bernard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Bernard. Uh, and Arp. And Arp. Yeah, he, yeah, he was a rare bird. <laughs> Odd duck, to say the least. Um, and yeah, um, yeah. Actually, you know, I, I think you have my list. Uh, so yeah, if you know, if you're looking for somebody in the spring, and uh, you know, I'd be happy to drop in again some evening. Sounds good. Sounds good. We'll uh, we'll look. We'll queue you up sometime in the spring. We'll let we'll let you know. Probably hear from David David Bishop. So thanks. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. Who's planning on coming to the uh, open house tomorrow? I know I'll be there for a little while. Uh, we're gonna see if uh, we're gonna see if we can't uh, do some ad hoc internet improvement over at the site. Bob will be there. Good to see you, Bob. Jackie might come. Dave Bishop will come. Carol's coming. All right, good. So we should have a good crowd there. Just uh, remember, bring a mask. We're going to keep our social distancing, but at least we can socialize a bit and uh, see each other for a little while. It's been, uh, it's been a rough, uh, what was it, eight months now, something like that? Crazy, crazy amount of time that we've been uh, shut down. But... Uh, Look forward to seeing some of you guys out there on uh, on Saturday. Um, and so, yeah, we'll do observing. Uh, it, certainly, if it's going to be clear tomorrow night, there's people around. Feel free to, uh, to to stay or come later in the day. If you want to do some observing, any members allowed to go to the site and uh, do some observing if later on. It's nice. Um, but we'll do uh, we'll have a dark sky observing next saturday night that'll be a dark night dark sky weekend and we'll uh hopefully it's going to be warm we'll see what happens but i'm actually looking forward to the geminids because it, it looks like the geminids over the next few years this year and then in the next few years is going to be a really good meteor shower so that's a month away that's something to plan for especially if it's going to if we can get any kind of decent weather or december is december but you never know we get all kinds of weather in december we'll see what happens there all right looks like we can get a bunch of people out there tomorrow who else was inspired to do the herschel the herschel 400 say anybody else peter are you still here you and i talked about doing it but we never i think he left but we never uh we never took it up Dave Bishop did the 90s. So Dave, would you, would you want to try the uh, 2482? Once um, I've retired, Bob says. Go ahead. When, back when I did the Herschel catalog was when this thing called the internet was first sort of starting up. And I got onto a couple of what were then email SIGs. One was called site at space that astro. And I was talking to several people about the Herschel catalog. And it turned out that um, a friar in Canada had done some serious work trying to find the original Herschel notes and the original Herschel catalogs. And he gave me a copy of his work, which wow. I then typed into the computer. And that became the basis for the Herschel catalog that's online today. Wow, that's pretty cool. And in fact, if you go to the link that I posted on the web page earlier, you see my original catalog. And all the other catalogs that are online now, including the Herschel 400, were actually built off of that. I'll, uh, I'll copy and paste it down at the bottom of the chat here so people can well, find it. I'm all seeing that, dude, yeah. That's cool. So, uh, yeah, if you want that. And Nick well, reminds me that the Leonids are yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Go fin finish up, finish up. Well, that's what that's what got me into the Herschel 400. It was part of the Astronomical League's observing thing. Um, after I did the Mizier catalog, I started on the Herschel 400. But I had access to a lot more data than they did. So I kept on going. And I did some 500 objects which wow. I sent into them. 
when I when I finally did it. There were some Very objects. Cool. I was using my eight inch telescope. <clears throat> you see my eight inch dob. Yeah. And I did all five hundred with my dob. And some of them, like I said, were just about impossible. The North American Nebula was the one that I just plain could not get. I put my telescope in that part of the sky. I used binoculars in that part of the sky. I could not get it. And then I met this guy. And the guy's name was Alan Babcock. And Alan Babcock lived at the end of Babcock Road, at the base of Babcock Hill, in the town of Babcock. And he and his the family flesh. were the only people that had lived out there for the past century. Talk about a dark sky site. Yeah, it's go. about 40 miles from the Baseball Hall of Fame in the southern oh, tier. Cooperstown. Yeah. yeah. And uh, from his top of Babcock Hill, I could see the North American Nebula with my naked eye. And that's Whoa. how I finally got that one. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. I had a hard yep. time finding my constellations because there were too many stars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been, I've, I've seen that in the Adirondacks, but that's that's amazing. You can almost see your shadow in the light of the galaxy casting down yeah. on you. It's, it, cool. it's incredible if you get to a true dark sky site. Yeah, uh, they put up a um, a twenty four hour gas station fifty miles north of him, and he says it ruined his northern horizon. Wow. 20 <laughs> miles away. 20 miles away. Jeez. So uh, Nick reminds us that the Leonids are this month as well. And actually, um, this, we might have good skies for that too because the, uh, the new moon is next weekend and it peaks on the 16th and 17th. So it should be fairly dark. Uh, let's see, the moon will be rising at sunset, I think. So, yeah, we might have some dark dark skies for the Leonids next weekend, or the next Sunday, Monday. Maybe we'll take a look at that as well. It's cool. Nick will be out there taking images of the uh, Milky Way, hoping to get some Leonids, right? That's the plan. All right, good. All right, with that, I will let you go. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a great evening. I hope to see a bunch of you tomorrow afternoon. Uh, at the open house, masks on and uh, and having a good time. So thanks everyone for coming. Have a great evening. I'll see some of you tomorrow and maybe uh, next week as well at the uh, at observing. Good night everyone. Close guys. <laughs>